Well, we just talked at length about the market revolution, what it was, and what some of its effects were, on, in a practical sense, on the economy. And uh, we talked a little bit about some of the changes in day-to-day -day living and ways of thinking it brought about with increased industrialization, with more people moving off the farms and into the cities and having kind of a different approach to a lot of things. But what we're going to do now is go deeper into that to look at uh, some of the social and cultural changes that came about during that period that sort of started paving the way for American culture and American society to be in the form that, uh, that we know it now. Um, however, I want to look also at some of the other things that were going on at around the same time in the country and around the world that were all sort of interconnected with the market revolution. Now, for one thing, the market revolution, you will recall, is kind of like the, uh, uh, the result of the union between the Industrial Revolution and that offshoot of the Industrial Revolution, the Transportation Revolution, particularly specifically in the United States because the U.S. was such a large, geographically large country compared to European countries. Now, in Europe, it wasn't so much uh, a, uh, a revolution in the same sense as it was in the U.S., but the Industrial Revolution was uh, hugely, hugely impactful, obviously. And as industrialized capitalism rolled along for the better part of uh, more than half a century in Europe uh, and led to big social changes there as well. That all kind of culminated uh, in 1848 in uh, what was known as the Spring of Revolutions, when uh, revolutions spread, most of them unsuccessfully, uh, throughout many European countries with uh, often middle class and working class people with some reformers joining in, uh, trying to overthrow the system of industrialized society as it existed at that time. And uh, one of the more famous examples of this in 1848 happened in France. And if you have seen or read Les Miserables, this is the backdrop for that story, for the, uh, the climax of that story there on the barricades. And around that same time in 1848, guy on the left there, uh, whose name was Karl Marx, published a pamphlet called The Communist Manifesto. And uh, about 20 years later, he would write his uh, best, known, uh, best known and most influential work, Das Kapital. Um, we're not going to go into a much detail about about Marx, but I am going to mention some of the concepts in a little bit to look at how they tie in with the stuff we're talking about, and also just because you will, so that you will recognize them, because a lot of his concepts are used regularly in history, uh, in uh, the English department, in sociology for for terminology. All right, so that's happening in Europe. Remember the uh, market revolution roughly in the U.S. 1820 to 1850. And it ran kind of concurrently with what is known as the Age of Jackson or the Jacksonian era, named after President Andrew Jackson, who certainly wasn't president for this 40-year period. Um, in fact, he wasn't even alive through this whole 40-year period of 1820 to 1860. He died in 1845. Uh, he was president. He was elected president for the first time in 1828, although he ran and won the popular vote in 1824. Uh, then he was uh, re-elected in 1832. But uh, his influence, the influence of his policies, and sort of the association of Jackson with the big changes going on, kind of uh, outlasted even Jackson's life, all the way up to the eve of the Civil War. So, you got the market revolution, you have the age of Jackson, uh, 
And this period was also part of what is known as the Victorian era in Great Britain, but also in the United States. Now, the Victorian era is named for Queen Victoria, who was crowned queen in 1837 and reigned until her death in 1901. So the Victorian era is most of the 19th century. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of historians will actually begin the uh, periodization of that era before she was crowned and say roughly from 1830 to 1900. Now, it wasn't exactly the same, but a lot of the changes taking place in the U.S. also took place in Great Britain. And that, uh, well, the United States circa 1840, 1850, all the way up to 1880s and so forth, sometimes referred to as the Victorian Amer America because it was taking place during this time period. So that means that the period from 1830 to about 1850 is usually called the early Victorian era. So that's what we have going on, the market revolution. You've got the age of Jackson, the Victorian era, all of those things closely interconnected and you've just got the age of revolution in general that starts happening in uh, in Europe that is based on uh, labor unrest and class unrest and it's not going to translate the same way in the United States during that time period but there will be uh, there will be repercussions there will be echoes that will uh, uh, sort of reached the U.S. later in the 19th century. Well, the Victorian era in Britain and the U.S. is often um, associated with uh, sort of uh, a sense of sexual repression, of Puritanism. In fact, the Puritans kind of get a, uh, a bad rap uh, in the modern uh, era in the 21st century because the fact is a lot of stuff that people today will call puritanical um, is not stuff the Puritans did or believed but it's rather Victorian so there were some some big changes in how people looked at life and lived life where the elemental passions were concerned um, the English expression keep a stiff upper lip don't let your lip quiver. Don't show emotion. So this, this period, and again, this is all um, tied together, uh, and it's all repercussions and reactions to the Industrial Revolution and the Market Revolution. This led to the, uh, the rise of respectability. Be respectable, and respectability became, for much of the 19th century, one of the paramount concerns of Americans and, uh, and Britons. Uh, so, that means <clears throat> to be respectable, you have to behave in a certain way. And that certain way, primarily, is you have to control yourself. Control your emotions. Control your baser Base, yeah, your baser urges. Um, and you have to conform socially because everyone else, it is implied, is trying to be respectable and to be respected for their respectability. So you have to fit in. Uh, think about expressions like, you know, you can't do this or you can't do that because what would the neighbors think? or you can't do this or you can't do that because that's not how it's done in the proper home. So there was a lot of emphasis on that sort of thing. And there was also a lot of condescension toward the poorer class of people, the rough elements of society. Well, that was nothing new. We've talked about that, uh, that sense of... Uh, of condescension before but now that respectability and control of your emotions is being stressed so much that leads to those rough elements being looked down on more than ever 
because because the feeling was those poorer people didn't control themselves they let loose with their passions with their emotions with their angers with their lusts um, and they just weren't respectable and that's what you have to do you have to be respectable you have to make sure you're not doing anything that could be questioned that could bring your morality into question your respectability and that translated into uh, into fashion actually in some interesting ways now let's take a look at the two pictures on the bottom on the left is a portrait of a lady from the 1700s and that that you can find portraits like that you can find hundreds of them uh, it was the style in Europe and in the United States in the 1700s for ladies to have low-cut gowns uh, and uh, sometimes dresses that went mid-calf even uh, sort of having a buxom look was uh, was something that was uh, viewed as attractive and positive in the 1700s. Lady on the right is a Victorian lady. During the Victorian era, it would be scandalous for a woman of society to be dressed like the woman on the left there, to be dressed essentially like her grandmother used to be. Uh, so you can't even show your neck if you can help it. And you certainly, absolutely, certainly would never, ever, as a lady, show your ankles. Oh, you tramp if you did. So this kind of uh, is not what most people expect, because we tend to have this idea that fashion and the perception of what is moral and acceptable or not kind of was always better in the past, always stricter in the past, and gradually got more and more loosened. But that's not really how it happens. It's actually kind of cyclical. Uh, and so this is a case where, you know, um, ladies wore low-cut dresses. In the 1700s, in the 1800s, they would have been... Um, social outcasts for doing that then in the 1900s it came back um another uh, another example uh for what i'm talking about is alcohol consumption we would tend to think that people have gotten drunker as time goes on but in reality in the 1700s people drank i think five times more alcohol per person than they actually do today then in the 1800s you had the temperance movement trying to end alcohol consumption completely and then that came back you see what i'm saying in fact this is kind of odd to me as uh, as i talk to people who are in elementary school like my granddaughter um a lot of the uh, like dress codes and stuff and behavior codes are way stricter now than they were 40 years ago when i was in elementary school anyway uh to get back to the matter at hand the Victorian era uh, is all about self-control and respectability. And if you're a lady, why, you want to show how respectable you are by not doing anything that could inflame the lusts of those hapless males walking around, like, you know, showing your ankle. And this translates into furniture. Uh, on the top there, the chair on the left is a typical chair from the 1700s. You've probably seen them before. I mean, they make chairs like that now. Uh, but, uh, you know, antique roadshow or whatever, you'll see chairs like this with these beautiful, elaborately carved and curved arms and legs. It was during the Victorian era, they started putting skirts around chairs so that guys wouldn't be sitting around looking at those bare legs on those chairs and get dirty thoughts. Uh, that sounds kind of ridiculous, but, but it's true. Now, something else that is, uh, that is true about this type of thing is that usually the more a society tries to repress the expression of those kinds of things, the, the the more it 
actually really behind the scenes underground happens. Um, so in the Victorian era, all these uh, ladies of the middling class or upper classes uh, were dressed like in you know all the way up uh, from uh, from the soles of their feet up to the top of their neck, not showing an inch of skin if they could help it. Um, but it was also a time when there was a flourishing of pornography underground and a flourishing of uh, BDSM behavior behind the scenes. Anyway, be that as it may. So, um, respectability. That's what I'm really going to be stressing here and, and what that means and, and how, it gets, uh, how it gets expressed. So, we're going to take a deep dive into that in a moment. But first, I want to come back to Karl Marx. I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But I, I do want you to at least hear these terms because you may be hearing them in other contexts and other classes. And people will be talking as if you know what they mean. And maybe you do. Uh, but I've noticed that uh, uh, these works and concepts are not explored the way that they used to be in uh, uh, in college and certainly not in high school. So, um, Marxist terms for class. Uh, you know how I like my pyramids, so I got one for you. Um, at the bottom, you have people that are called the lumpen proletariat. Um, then above them, the larger group, the proletariat, which is the working class. The lumpen proletariat are the, you know, they're the, the lower class, but uh, lumpen carries a, a meaning of ragged. And also, uh, in the 1800s, I think it could sometimes carry the, uh, the meaning of nefarious or thuggish. So the lumpen proletariat are the people at the very, very bottom, uh, sometimes homeless, um, vagrants, uh, career small-time street criminals, and the, uh, the chronically unemployed. And by that I mean, well, in the, uh, in the 19th century, if you were disabled, you probably were unemployed. You, pro you probably would wind up falling into this category. Uh, we have uh, social safety nets in the 20th and 21st century that, that uh, usually can prevent that. But uh, that's the very, very bottom. And then the proletariat, that's the biggest group. That is the working class. The people who don't own a business, they just go to work. And what they are selling is their own labor. Okay, And you'll notice that is by far the biggest chunk of society. Above them... You have the middle class, or the bourgeoisie, which is divided into two parts. Haute bourgeoisie and petite bourgeoisie. Haute and petite mean uh, high and, and, and low or little in French. Bourgeoisie, uh, bourgeois, carried the sense of someone who lives in a city, essentially. So, the petite bourgeoisie are the small business owners. Um... They own a small business. They actually have to get up every day and go to work too, even though they own the business. And even though they may have some employees, they usually don't have many. So they've got to be working. And usually their family is also working in their business. Um, that also includes uh, middle management um, in uh, the service sector, which is big now. Uh, and doctors and lawyers, uh, if they are small independent doctors and lawyers like that have a very small private practice or if they're uh, a doctor that works at a hospital or a lawyer that works at a law firm where they're not in charge you know they're sort of like very 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 junior and then above them the haute bourgeoisie the upper middle class that's where that's where a, a lot of the control is over labor those are the uh, um, the people who own the means of production, the people that own uh, larger, like, uh, businesses, factories, and so forth. 
uh, and employ a lot of people. And they own a factory and they don't have to get up and go like do manual labor in the factory to keep it running. Okay. Uh, they're at the very, very top, the aristocracy, uh, the top 2%, the super wealthy who live basically in a whole other world than the other 98%. So um, those terms, when you hear them, I hope that you can recall at least somewhat about, uh, about what they mean. Um, but now we're going to take a deep dive into class and respectability. And we're going to do that by looking at the wheel of respectability. Now, this is a concept that was developed by my friend and mentor, Dr. Bill Sutton, um, who taught that uh, at the University of Illinois High School for many, many years to many, many people, uh, and with whom I, uh, I worked uh, quite a bit under his tutelage. So this uh, this is going to be this is going to be some imaging, some some modeling to help us to visualize what some of this stuff means by virtue of looking at this wheel. All right, Sutton's wheel of respectability. Uh, basic uh, definition right there in the center: liberal Republican core turns on limits and control and power and privilege and restraint of elemental passions and access to power. So liberal Republican core. Um, classical liberalism, classical Republicanism, 18th century liberalism and Republicanism, which means basically liberalism is an emphasis on the rights of the individual and Republicanism is an emphasis on civic virtue, civic duty, and promoting the greater good of the community. So those two things in balance, essentially what made America um, in the, uh, the 18th century. So that core, turning on two axes. So you have the axis of limits that is vertical here. Uh, limits, that is the amount of limitations you impose on yourself, the amount of self-control that you show. So higher uh, th that you are on there, the more self-control, uh, the lower on the wheel, the less. And then the horizontal axis, the axis of power and privilege. So. The farther to the right you are, the more power and privilege you have, and the farther to the left, the less. So that uh, people are divided into the uh, essentially three main classes, right? The very, very poor, who, and, and this, this, this concept, these concepts developed in the 1840s, essentially. So the very, very poor came to be regarded as depraved depraved and dependent. Oh my gosh, you look at literature from that period and forward and they will be talking about those lower class people who have no concept of right or wrong, no concept of propriety, no concept of morals. They're just out there doing whatever they want to do because they don't care. Uh, that's how they're looked at. Uh, the middling classes Today we would say middle class, but in the 19th century, middling class was most often used. Those are the members of society who are useful and productive, which that is the big plus. And all the way over on the axis of power, all the way over to the right, those 2% we talked about, the elite, the aristocrats, um, sort of uh, look down on as being unworthy and as being parasites themselves and particularly various times in American history uh, like uh, if you've uh, if you remember the little guy on the Monopoly box his name is uh, Rich Uncle Moneybags stereotype of a robber baron robber barons were very much looked down on in the late 1800s early 1900s uh, and this has kind of wavered a little bit over time, but not a whole lot. So, uh, here are some 
examples of uh, some of these types of folks. So over on the rough, here you've got the stereotype, and these are, uh, there's a lot of stereotypes um, in how, in, in this, not because the, uh, the wheel is stereotyped, but because it's about perceptions of people. And the perceptions of people are often based on stereotypes. So there you've got the rough class. Uh, that is uh, the lumpen proletariat. That is the, uh, the, the homeless people. And it is the criminals, the thugs, um, the quote unquote white trash. Um, you know, here's the, the guy uh, in, the, uh, in the very old and beat up trailer with an old and beat up vehicle. So that's the rough and they're viewed as depraved and dependent. Uh, and then over on the, the right, I uh, got a picture of uh, John F. Kennedy, who came from a very wealthy family. And uh, I don't know, some of my students probably won't even recognize uh, Paris Hilton. Uh, it's a little out of date. I should have put a Kardashian on here, but I can't tell them apart. Um, anyway, uh, so the very, very, very extremely wealthy. It sort of is like what Alexis de Tocqueville remarked on when he was touring America that you couldn't tell someone's social class by looking at their clothes because a lot of the really rich people that he uh, he met essentially and I'm paraphrasing dressed like bums because they didn't care uh, whereas a lot of the what we would call middling class people spent what money they had to get nice clothes so they could look richer than they were right so both of these groups, the proto-aristocrats uh, and the, uh, the rough, are down in the negatives on this, this axis of limits. Uh, so they're viewed by the people in the middle, the middle class, as equally kind of, uh, kind of negative, kind of a drain on society. I would point out that uh, I showed the picture of the sort of stereotypical redneck person. Um, this is another version of the perspective of the lumpen proletariat or the rough individuals of color living in the inner city. So uh, you got these two guys here in the lower left. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm, I'm uh, saying something that you already know but have never articulated. But in the 21st century, people on the political left tend to demonize that guy on the right, right there. And people on the political right tend to demonize the guy on the left, right there. Unfairly in both cases, uh, in my opinion, because they are projecting upon those individuals their own sense of values and a sense of um, immorality on their part, when in reality, people from that uh, rough section of society grew up and live in a different reality than, than those other folks do. Uh, and this, this shapes how you look at life. This shapes how you react in certain circumstances. And this explains why when someone from the rough section of the wheel suddenly becomes really rich, they don't act like middle-class people all of a sudden. They don't, you know, um, start... Uh, opening investment portfolios often and, uh, you know, uh, saving and, and, and doing all that stuff because that's foreign to them. They continue to, to behave in the way that it was necessary to behave in their circumstances to get by, to survive, right? And so that's why, and I'm talking about someone like, uh, like Elvis Presley, for example, 
uh, would be an example, uh, or various other musicians, black and white, who suddenly got rich, or athletes, um, or artists and entertainers of other kinds, um, often criticized by the media and by the middle class for their behavior because they're sort of acting outrageously, but their behavior is not outrageous in that rough sector. So that is a, that is a challenge. And I can tell you that personally, on a personal level, I have a very hard time understanding or even conceptualizing a lot of middle class thinking about money and investment funds and IRAs and uh, mortgages and all that stuff because you know my family never owned any property never owned a home and it's just not something that I ever heard or thought about and it still is difficult for me anyway uh, on the uh, upper left side the rough respectable that is your basic working class people your respectable working class people your construction workers your farmers People that get up and go to work. Now, uh, the country today is dominated by the service industry. So uh, that includes people that get up and go to their job at a department store or, uh, or a restaurant or whatever. Okay. Then you've got the, uh, the respectable proto-aristocratic uh, or essentially the, the, the middle class. You got the working class there on the upper left. You got the poor on the lower left, working class upper left. You got the middle class there in the upper right. And then uh, again in the lower right, the, the elites, the aristocrats, the multimillionaires, the top 2% who uh, have often been portrayed in American culture as being just unconstrained, unrestrained, doing whatever the heck they want to do. The same way that the people on the very poorest end of the spectrum have been viewed. Um, and here we've got uh, Paris Hilton showing up there again. It's the same idea that uh, to people in the middle, the people on each end of, uh, of the continuum, the really, really poor, rough people, and the proto-aristocratic, hyper-wealthy people don't control themselves. The wealthy, super-wealthy people often don't control themselves because they're not reliant on what society thinks of them because they've got all they need. The very, very poor people also do not conform always to the uh, respectability uh, expectations of the middle class because they don't care because they don't have anything and acting that way isn't going to get them anything and therefore uh, there's, a, there's a sense of fatalism sometimes I might as well do might as well get what joy I can right now uh, but those attitudes are looked down on by people in the middle, whether they are working class or upper middle class. Now, here we have a couple of magenta axes or lines making, a, making an X there. These are what Dr. Sutton calls the lines of antipathy. Uh, antipathy, in case you don't know, means you don't like something. So, here's how that works. People over there on the rough end of the spectrum, lower left, um, they have strong dislike often, not for the super rich, but for the upper middle class, the middle class, and the feeling is mutual. You know, uh, sometimes you will hear news stories or maybe where you live, this will happen. I've seen it happen before. Um, a city will propose extending the bus lines farther up away from uh, the, the city, the, 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 the center of the city, extending the bus lines so people can travel further on public transportation. That sounds like a win-win, right? That sounds like a good thing. 
But a lot of times, people living in the suburbs, middle class people, do not want bus service coming to their neighborhoods because it means poor people can come to their neighborhood and they don't want that. Um, there's also frequently uh, talk uh, in politics or on the news about um, low income housing, federally subsidized housing to help poor people and middle class people being concerned, bent out of shape sometimes, if that poorer uh, housing is too close to where they live. So lines of antipathy. And then, you know, the people, the rough class get really ticked off at the, uh, uh, the middle class people for having those attitudes about them. And we'll refer to them as, you know, the, the big shots, the big wigs uh, who think they're better than, than they are. Right. Uh, and then you've got the rough respectable. That is basic working class people. They don't mind middle class people at all. Uh, in fact, they're often trying to work to become a part of that middle class. But they don't like those super wealthy people. Um, now I say they're often trying to work to become middle class. It is, it is not uncommon, although it's also not common. It's not uncommon for someone to move up one square or one wedge clockwise on this wheel. Like if you're from the rough class, you might make it into the rough respectable class. You probably won't make two jumps and you almost certainly won't make three. Um, it, it does happen, but very rarely, very rarely. All right, if there are lines of antipathy, there are also lines of affinity. That is, uh, groups that like each other uh, on this on this wheel, so that the uh, working class, not only uh, do they not dislike the respectable proto aristocracy, but uh, they have an affinity with them. Um, and then, now this is where things get weird. The rough class, the very poorest class are most likely to have a sense of affinity, not with the working class, not with the rough respectable or the respectable proto-aristocratic, not any of the respectable people, with the very unrespectable, highly wealthy proto-aristocratic group uh, because they admire them. They admire the fact that uh, the proto-aristocrats are above all this respectability stuff. And realizing that, realizing that now, no matter where you fall on the political spectrum or what your political beliefs are, realizing that it helps to understand why people on that rough end of the spectrum and race is, is an issue in, in, in this particular thing I'm talking about, but you know, surprisingly, there were a lot of non-white white people on this very rough end of the spectrum who have an affinity for this guy um, and an admiration. Uh, so actually, that makes maybe more sense uh, than you may have thought that it did. So the Wheel of Respectability, very good tool for, for understanding the middle class and, uh, and how all that works and how respectability becomes a part of it. All right, so uh, hope you come back and refer to this uh, and that you think about it more. Because the more you think about it, like a lot of the stuff I think that I talk about, the more you think about it, the more it will make sense. Now, when it comes to the affinity between the rough and the proto-aristocratic. There is, uh, well, actually, there are a couple of really kind of outstanding um, historical antecedents for that. One of them is Bacon's Rebellion, 1676. Uh, Nathaniel Bacon was a very privileged elite person who had a very, very strong connection to the poor people, 
in the colony of Virginia, he felt a sense of being aggrieved and mistreated by, uh, by the government, and so did they. And they, he got them to follow him. That's one example. Another example, uh, a different kind of example than either of the two we just mentioned, because really, uh, whether you're talking about Nathaniel Bacon or Donald Trump, uh, they were born into that proto-aristocratic um, class. This guy was not. Andrew Jackson, old hickory. He was, uh, he was from the rough end of the wheel of respectability of the social continuum. He was the, uh, the seventh president of the United States and the first person to be elected president that did not grow up in a wealthy, elite household. The first person to grow up poor. He literally was born in a log cabin, and he made his own way. Uh, he studied for the bar and became a, a lawyer, and uh, from there a, a military leader and a politician and so forth. Well, there were a lot of reasons that... Uh, the more respectable uh, class uh, in um, the proto-respectable class in America disliked Andrew Jackson. But one of those reasons was his behavior. He didn't act um, the way that you're supposed to act in a proper home. He acted like a rough person. Um, he was uh, constantly getting into duels and shooting people and getting shot. He got shot in the chest one time in a duel. The other guy shot first, shot him in the chest, and he just stood there and shot the other guy. And the bullet was lodged so close to his heart it couldn't be safely taken out, so he just carried it around with him the rest of his life. Uh, when he was president, there was an assassination attempt on him, and the guy tried to shoot him, and the gun misfired. Uh, and then the, uh, the bodyguards of the president had to protect the the assassin from, from Andrew Jackson, who started beating him with his stick. Uh, so that's not the sort of thing that you think that uh, Thomas Jefferson might have done. Um, this was also made evident when Jackson was elected president in 1828. He was the first person to be elected president as a, quote, man of the people. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is it had only been over the previous few years that the various states had gotten rid of their rules that you have to own a certain amount of property to be able to vote. So uh, by the time Jackson ran for president the second time in 28, there was a universal white male suffrage in, in every state. So poor people. And working class people, men, white men, who couldn't vote before, now can vote. And they're not voting for a, uh, a proto-aristocrat, uh, upper middle class person. Uh, they're voting for this very, very rough, very wealthy by this time, uh, Andrew Jackson. And when he was sworn in at his inauguration, he made it open to the public, which had never been done before, and lots of people came swarming in, and all the upper-class uh, uh, Washingtonians uh, were just shocked at all these common and vulgar people and farmers and stuff crowding in on the White House, uh, climbing in the windows. A bunch of farmers brought their pigs with them, and there were pigs running through the halls of the White House. Everybody was aghast, except Andrew Jackson, because he was cementing his reputation as a man of the people. And really what he was doing was he was cementing that bond of roughness uh, that, uh, in his case, he had uh, skipped two or three uh, sections on that wheel, but he was still at heart that, uh, that rough, rough-hewn individual. Now, there's all this, um, all this talk both today and previously about how uh, folks on the margins were looked down on, especially people in the back country. And I talked about this a little bit before, about how uh, 
there were some changes in attitudes toward the people living in the back country uh, around this time. And so let's, uh, let's talk about that some a little bit. But before we do that, I do want to look at one more aspect of class in America in the 21st century. And that is these numbers here on the right, the number of people who are lower or working class in America as of 2018, the most recent uh, uh, numbers at the time of this recording, the number who are lower and working class, the number who are middle and upper middle, and the number of people who are upper class. And then on the left, that chart uh, goes back for, uh, well, up to 2016. Uh, it goes back 16 years to 2000. And that reflects what American, uh, what class Americans think they're in. All right. So first, the reality. Uh, in 2018, the average American income was $63,000 a year. So to be qualified as working class or lower uh, lower class you had to make less than two-thirds of the national average so forty two thousand dollars a year 29 percent of Americans almost a third of Americans were in that category uh, to be in the upper class um, that is above two hundred thousand dollars a year and that's 19 percent of the population. Now to get up to the top 1%, you'd have to make about half a million dollars a year or more. So I would imagine uh, millionaires are actually, you know, the top one half of 1%. Now these numbers haven't changed that much over the last 20 years. Uh, back in 2000, I think the middle class was 54%. And uh, the uh, uh, lower and working class was 28, upper class was 18. So that's where those two point, uh, that two point differential came from. So roughly, it's been about the same over the last 20 years. Now, over the last 50 years, it has changed. Uh, in 1970, it was over 60% of Americans who were actually middle class. Okay, so that's the reality. Now let's look at the perception. The percentage of people over time who view themselves as upper middle class or middle class is uh, in 2016 and by the way the numbers in 2016 were about the same as 2018 for the reality so 2016 about 51 percent of people when the reality was 52 percent of people so that's uh, you know pretty uh, pretty spot on although it had changed over the previous 16 years, 16 years earlier, it had fallen actually 12 points. In the year 2000, when the reality was about the same, so far as percentages, um, more people thought they were middle class, actually, than, than actually were at that time. Now, uh, how many people think they're working class or even lower class? That has risen substantially by actually a little more than the same number. 20 years ago, it was uh, 33%, and now it's 48%. That's a 15-point increase who think they are uh, working class or lower class. And you'll notice that's actually about 20 points higher, 19 points higher than the reality. Uh, then let's take a look at upper class. This is the most revealing. That has uh, people who think they are upper class has fallen from a high of 3% in 2000 to about 1% now. Now, why is that interesting? Because it's 19%. It's 19 times higher than people self reference themselves. Uh, so, in other words, uh, for every 19 people who are upper class, 18 of them will tell you they're not that they're middle class. And they tell themselves that, that they're middle class. 
Uh, there has been, it seems, over the last 15 years, particularly I noticed that the big change happened right around 2008, 2009, so far as working class, which that's when the economy collapsed. After the economy collapsed, people were more likely to think of themselves as, as, as poor, uh, whether that was the reality or not. And that may be because they had some changes in their circumstance that maybe weren't as drastic as they felt. But it really is revealing that, um, that so many people who are upper class don't think of themselves that way. Um, and you know why that is? I mean, in fact, I bet you know lots of people who are in that 19%. You may be one of them. And I bet you don't think of yourself as upper class. And you know why I think that is? Because it's still not respectable in America to consider yourself upper class. And that means you don't want other people to consider you upper class. Um, because you want to be in the middle, in the middle um, and viewed as either respectable middle class or that rough respectable that we talked about, poor but, but respectable. All right, well think about that and we will go back to uh, the 19th century now.